We'll just pick it up. They win. We should be live. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight on this Monday evening. We have a nice crew online with us right now, and I believe there's a few popping up here on uh, face, Facebook. Uh, you glad you could all join us. A couple new people with us. Welcome, Tim. Good to see you with us tonight. And uh, Namar. Namar is an adopted son, so I've got a, quite a diverse family now. Well, it's good to see everyone, and just want to give you a good uh, a blessing on you for the things you do, uh, staying uh, safe during the lockdowns and during the 25% that we got to do, wear a mask. Uh, like they said, it's not a political thing, it's a life or death thing. Yeah, so, so life or death that I, I just want to let you know that um, in Michigan now, we've lost two of my relatives in Michigan now, and it's uh, it's hitting too close to home. I lost uh, a cousin, Bill Church, and his son have passed away up there. He was, uh, Bill was 73, and he was a historian of our, our tribe. So we just really lost somebody major. To our communities up there so we just really want you guys to all stay safe during this time keep coming back and pray continue to pray for those doctors and everyone working to get the vaccines out to us that there'll be a smooth transitions that are happening be with them so uh, well we're excited for tonight uh, uh, our friend here our musician, our drummer, our singer, our good partner in ministry, Brian, is going to be our speaker tonight. We're excited for him to share you know, his heart in ministry with us tonight. We've been meeting together now for uh, almost three years and nine months or so now. We've been It's uh, been a good journey. Uh, church planting uh, takes time, and we've built up a good, a good group of people, a solid core people and looks like we're going to grow even more in the future here so we're excited about that so i just want to welcome you all and we'll give it over to uh, who's up next i believe heather is going to bring us the four directions prayer tonight four directions prayer Brian. uh oh wow that's a little weird light <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, <laughs> Great spirit of light, come to me out of the east with the power of the rising sun. Let there be light in my words. Let there be light on my path that I walk. Let me remember always that you give the gift of a new day. And never let me be burdened with sorrow by not starting over again. Great spirit of creation, send me the warm and soothing winds from the south. Comfort me and caress me when I am tired and cold. Unfold me. 
me like the gentle breezes that unfold the leaves on the trees. As you give to all the earth your warm, moving wind, give to me so that I may grow close to you in warmth. Great life-giving spirit, I face the west, the direction of sundown. Let me remember every day that the moment will come when my sun will go down. Never let me forget that I must fade into you. Give me a beautiful color. Give me a great sky for setting so that when it is my time to meet you, I can come with glory. Great spirit of love, come to me with the power of the north. Make me courageous when the cold wind falls upon me. Give me strength and endurance for everything that is harsh, everything that hurts, everything that makes me squint. Let me move through life ready to take what comes from the north. Man did not create the web of life, but he is but a strand in it. Whatever man does to the web, he does to himself. Now we're moving into a segment called Creation Insights when I take something, uh, a story that might have to do with an animal or something in nature or a difficulty. And here is tonight. It's a poem I just wrote, a little, little different beat here. It's called Ode to Stinker. In the evening down the lane, when the silver grass doth sway, a skunking for her meals keeps the feline crowds at bay. With tail aloft she waddles, sees the strangers, darts away. Like a roller ball, the stinker's exit's smooth as creme brulee. When she gets tired in the morning, goes home and ends her day. She takes grubs with her potatoes in her dinner-time souffle. And when she wanders, drowsy, for the loo along the way, if she threatens with a handstand, you best back away and pray. So this is, this is inspired by our evening walks we take here, all the different animals in the neighborhood. So I don't know if anyone has any similar skunk experiences or, or any other. <laughs> What's the Last thing? night I had a visit from a bunny. A bunny. Oh, bunny. Here, bunny. Oh. And whenever he comes to visit, he leaves straw all over the place and I have to vacuum. But uh, he's getting to the point now to where he likes to be loved. It took a <laughs> long time for his owner to get him to that point to where he just was people, ew, ew, don't touch me. But what reminds me of us in this little guy is he absolutely despises to be picked up and grabbed but once he's held tightly and loved and petted bunnies purr they do it differently than cats but they purr but the the what i saw as similarity is sometimes we're on our own path doing our own thing we want to think our own thoughts and, and for the Lord to reach out and get us, maybe there's a struggle. But once he gets us and once we're close to him and feel his heart, then we love the love that we receive in that place. Oh, the bunny is in your backyard? No, a friend of mine has him and a, a Samoya dog. And the Samoya and the bunny are best, best friends. The bunny is quite aggressive. And he, he they play together, but they attack each other. And it's oh. hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good thing he's not wrestling with the skunk you wrote your poem about. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. What is what is your uh, analogy for that? Is there some great uh, that's, thing? That's that's I think yet yet to brew. But I did learn <laughs> I did learn that skunks are um, they're not real aggressive. They're pretty chill. They they don't have very good eyesight either. So uh, you know if, if you just kind of uh, back away, you should be all right. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's situations we can get in and uh, just back away before insanity ensues <laughs> it might not be too late all, all right. right well we've got a couple songs all right unless somebody wants to toss in another animal story got an animal story speak now or wait till after the song <laughs> yeah well I'll, I'll share just real quick animals are real precious to us here we have a we have a german shepherd a hundred pound german shepherd and we have a, a cat named Myos. The dog is named Makwa. Myos is for cat. It's a Potawatomi word for cat and Makwa is a 
is a Potawatomi word for bear, because when he was a, a little pup, he looked like a little bear cub. And then out in the backyard, we've got a little cage with a rabbit, uh, a really, really chubby rabbit. So he's, uh, his name is Wabos. That's how they say uh, rabbit in our language too. So we, they're all uh, have a native name. But uh, just over the last couple of days here, uh, our dog uh, had a little accident. And he tried to tell me, he could tell that he was trying to tell me that something was wrong. And I, you know, we communicate pretty well. So when he was laying down, he was just stretching his arm towards me. Uh, if he got arms, and he's got four legs, but uh, he had a, he was he's stretching it out and he was moving it constantly and kind of like he wanted me to look at it. So I, I kneeled down and I, I went and I looked at it and he had snagged his, uh, you know, the, you know, they have the paw uh, pads, but then they got this way up here on the, on the ankle, they have this other, like a thumb nail that doesn't serve any purpose, but it's, it got snagged on something and it twisted and it was almost, almost came off. And today we went to the doctor to get it taken off. And uh, he's uh, right here. You can see he's, he's bandaged up right now. And, uh, they, they have their way of, of sharing with us in, in, a, in a good way that uh, it takes a long relationship to get to know what they're saying. And I think that's a story with, with all of our relationships. We, it takes time to get to know people. And uh, like Laura and I, for 30 years now, uh, we finish each other's sentences. Uh, we know what we're going to say even before we, <laughs> we know. Like, like tonight, uh, we're going to order out Cracker Barrel. So she knows what we're thinking even before we, we start, I was just thinking that myself. So it's like something telepathic happening, but there's something special between animals and us too. That's what I had to share. Thank you. All right. So we're gonna do uh, the Jesus is Lord song and then the River of Life song. And uh, who oh, else? did you see that one from oh, wait. the town? The live stream doesn't seem to be working. Could you please try, please? It works better for us. The live stream. You, it you got the live yeah. Okay. The live stream is on somewhere, whoever was asking. Oh, yeah, Rain Sue. Yeah, yeah so. No, it's, it might not be. The live stream might not be under the event, but it's on the Good Medicine Way yeah, page somewhere. Yeah, you scroll down a bit. So you may have to search for it a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, Facebook is funny about that sometimes. I was trying to get it to show up right with the event, but I don't think it did. Jeanette Dumlin says we're good. Okay, she but it's, yeah, it should be on there somewhere. Okay, and then Heather Heather posted the link in the chat um, if you're having problems finding it. So, all right, thank you, Heather. And moving on to a couple songs. Um, see, this is Jerry, what is that, Jerry Eagle Feathers? Yep. Okay, he... Is credited with the Jesus is Lord song, and then River of Life is by Jonathan Miracle. And uh, so we'll be doing those. Here we go.
Preston, if you're not driving anymore, <laughs> do you, you want to give us our announcements for tonight? Uh, yeah, I can actually do that. So, announcements would be, I'm, well, I'm way too dark. <laughs> so, so, announcements are going to be a uh, women's group or some meeting. So, on Wednesday, we have women's study. So, Alea, would you like to explain more about that? At 7 p.m. Mountain Time, uh, we're going through the Kindness Challenge, very powerful book. So uh, any ladies, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time, Wednesday, you'll find the link there on the Good Medicine Way uh, Facebook group. So we're also going through the book of, uh, after this upcoming new year, we're going to go to the book of Matthew. So it'll be very exciting, and I'm actually really excited to do that with the First Nations version. Um, the next uh, announcement is going to be next week is my talk. So just a forewarning, it's going to be on missing indigenous, uh, missing murdered indig indigenous women. So if you have any trauma or if you have anything that's going to be kind of hard about it, maybe I would say kind of watch it at um, from Facebook or watch it somewhere, watch it later pray about it i know it's gonna it's a very very hard topic but i feel like it's something that a native man and from a, how would jesus approach this topic so take it away who who's that heather <laughs> anyone as far as reading the creator's words bit uh can you do that, Heather or Preston, or shall I do that? I 
Heather Mike is going to do it this time. Okay. Okay. Hello. I think we're on Acts 27 at the end of it with 21. Um, was it 29? I, was I don't remember, but I'll read it anyway. <laughs> Visited by a spirit messenger. After they had gone for many days without food, small men, Paul, stood among them. Fellow travelers, he said to them, if you would have listened to me and not set out from Beast Island, Crete, you would not have suffered this injury and loss. But I say to you now, do not lose your courage, for even though our canoe will be lost, not one of us will lose our lives. Last night, a spirit messenger from the great spirit, the one I belong to and serve, stood by my side. Do not fear, he said to me, for you must stand before the ruler of the people of iron, Caesar. So look and see, the giver of life has gifted you with the lives of all who journey with you. The men just stared at small man Paul with wondering eyes and said nothing. So he once again spoke courage into their hearts. Be strong of heart, small man Paul said to them, for I have faith that the great spirit will do everything he told me but we will have to find an island to land on. They come near land. And how now, it had now been, it had now been, it had now been, it had now been, Sure. Okay. Not sure what happened. I'll, I'll keep reading if you, if you. She got, she got lost in the storm of feedback. If you come back. You yeah, it was um, something else <laughs> that happened there. Um, it had now been 14 nights that we had been driven about by the wind and waves of the sea with no wood at Derktic Sea. In the middle of the night, the men who guided the canoe could feel that we were near land. They began to test the depth of the water. It was as deep as a tall tree. Then a short distance later, they tested it again and found that it was not as deep. Since they knew the shoreline was rocky, they were afraid we might run into a large rock under the water. So they dropped four anchor rocks from the back of the canoe and prayed for the sun to rise. Some of the men tried to escape. But then some of the men trying to escape untied the life raft and lowered it into the water, pretending they were putting out more anchor rocks. Small man Paul saw what they were doing and went to the head soldier. If these men leave the canoe, he said to him and the other soldiers, you will not be saved and all will be lost. So the soldiers cut the leather straps from the life raft and let it drift away. He encourages the men. Just before the sun began to rise, small man Paul urged everyone to eat something. For 14 days, now you have been constantly worrying and have not eaten any food, he said to them. Please eat something now. You will need it to survive. Do not fear. No one will die or be harmed. Not even one hair from your heads will be lost. After he said this, he took a loaf of bread and giving thanks to the great spirit in front of them all, he broke it and began to eat. This gave the men courage, so they also began to eat. All in all, there were 276 persons in this great wooden canoe. When they finished eating, they tossed the rest of the grain over the side to lighten the canoe. Sunrise and a rough landing. When daylight came, they did not recognize the shoreline, but they could see a bay with a beach. They decided to try to run the canoe up into the sandy beach if possible. So they cut the ropes to the anchor rocks and left them in the water. At the same time, they untied the ropes holding the rudders in place. Then they set the men to the paddles and they paddled with all their might heading toward the beach. But on the way, the canoe struck a sandbar and stayed there. Stuck in the sand and the front of the canoe began to break from the force of the waves. The soldiers made a plan to kill the prisoners so no, none could escape by swimming away. But the head soldier wanting to spare the life of small man Paul stopped them. He ordered the ones who could swim to jump overboard and swim to land. The rest he sent floating on wooden poles and pieces of the canoe. In this way, all who were aboard made it safely to the land. This is the end of X-27. This is the word of the Lord. All right. 
Hey, Heather, according to my my list, you're uh, supposed to pray for the message now, too. <laughs> I can do that. All right. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> um, dear Heavenly Father, dear Creator, yeah, right us out, we're in together in many different areas in many parts of the world. Let us be able to embark in you and being able to embark in all your glory and what you've done and what you're doing for us. Let us be able to you know, open our hearts and soften our hearts and soften our minds through the message that you have given Brian and being able to Direct our our minds in this Advent season, and direct our and find forgiveness in all things, find being love and in the darkness, and allow Brian to speak to you from you, and be able to have us give a strong word of encouragement. In your good name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Preston. All right, so uh, for the sake of protocol, if anybody here is not familiar with me and doesn't know me, uh, my name is Brian Grover. I am the husband of Leah Grover. Um, I'm a third generation Hungarian immigrant on my mom's side, um, but my mom's generation was raised in a very uh, assimilative sort of environment so i i don't really retain anything of my uh, hungarian heritage um so and then on my dad's side uh it's mostly a uh, european british islands uh mix uh, mostly irish and scottish but it's a uh, it's kind of a big amalgamation of things um and I believe that my dad's ancestors came over during one of the Irish uh, potato famines. Um, so fairly recent presence on this uh, continent. Um, and uh, try to give honor to the First Nations that were here. And uh, we're coming to you tonight from the uh, traditional Pueblo lands. Um, Sandia Pueblo is most often credited uh, with the area that we're in, but um, there's 23 native people groups right here in the Albuquerque area. Um, 19 Pueblos, uh, the Navajo Nation is real close by, and then there's three bands of uh, Apache, I think, is, is how it all susses out, or two bands of Apache. I can't remember. But anyway, 23 groups of indigenous people here um, who've been here for a long, long time. And so we want to honor their presence here on the land and for care of taking the land, uh, even in the face of a lot of uh, colonial extractive uh, kinds of practices that aren't very nice to the land. Um, so we thank them for that. And uh, so with that, uh, we'll kind of get into the main meat of what I was going to talk about. So I was... Uh, Thinking about this, I've been, um, I'm actually in uh, school for uh, a master's degree in nursing and a project I've been working on um, has been dealing with um, uh, making healthcare more accessible and meaningful to native populations. And, uh, and part of that is um, honoring native ideas of wellness and well-being um, which have a lot to do with uh, walking in beauty or walking in harmony and being in good relationship with all your relations, uh, whether they're human, animal, plant, earth, sky, water, cosmos, like we're all connected and everything in creation is our relative. Um, that's a very important part of just about every native culture uh, that I've um, been able to learn a little bit about that seems like it's a pretty shared thing. And then uh, the idea of uh, the Navajo call it a uh, hajo, um, and it just means the beauty way. Uh, the Cherokee, who uh, Randy Woodley did a lot of research on because he's Cherokee, and I'm drawing a lot 
from uh, what Randy wrote in his um, book about uh, Shalom, as well as his book about decolonizing evangelicalism. Um, but for the Cherokee, they call it the Harmony Way. Uh, but the concepts are all um, really similar. Um, and what I wanted to bring out was that the uh, traditional concepts of, of living in harmony, living in peace, walking in beauty, being in right relationship, um, really has a lot of congruence, not only with the teachings of Jesus, but with the whole idea of the biblical idea of shalom and peace. Um, and if you want to know uh, more about that, I would really um, direct you to Randy Woodley's book, uh, Shalom in the Community of Creation, because um, he, he goes into it in depth. Um, so if, if you think what I'm saying is questionable, then you can go look at Randy's book for the whole story, because <laughs> uh, I'm not going to go nearly as deep as he does. Um, but anyway, Casey Church, our, uh, our fearless leader, and, uh, and his book on uh, contextualization called Holy Smoke, the Contextual Use of Native American Ritual and Ceremony, um, he talks about the idea that um, within a Native context in the church, that we really hope to replace a lot of the Western cultural things that are in the church that came out of European culture. And for most people in America, a lot of those rituals have really lost their meaning and symbolism. Um, and, and so for a church that deals with native people, we wanna to look to the native traditions and find uh, what's there that's uh, redeemable. And when you start looking into it, you find a lot of congruence between native traditions and uh, what the scriptures teach, uh, especially the, the teachings of Jesus. And um, Casey has said this, and there was um, uh, a Navajo elder up near Shiprock that I had the opportunity to talk with and take place in some ceremonies with um, a few years back. And there was also some medicine men uh, and women around uh, Tse Li in uh, the Navajo Nation um, who I talked with about this subject, about how do you bring together uh, ideas of native wellness with modern medicine. And they all said that for the native person, that especially when you're talking about emotional and psychological wounds and trauma, that native ceremony touches the heart of a native person more significantly um, than other approaches. Um, so it's really important to have that cultural grounding and to come to people in a way um, that makes sense to them. And uh, we've talked a lot in this group about how uh, the gospel of Jesus and Jesus' teachings were really misappropriated uh, by the uh, conquering focused uh, Roman Empire when, when they kind of co-opted Christianity and they began to really change the message of Christianity. Um, the early church was really very anti-militaristic. It was, it was very much ingrained in the teachings that you see in that time. Uh, so much so that it, that it was just kind of an assumed thing that you knew that like the idea of war and conquest um, wasn't a good thing. And you know that when you look at Jesus's teaching about um, you know, that the leader among you should be the servant of all. Um, and that when you look in uh, like the different parables Jesus taught um, about the, the kingdom of heaven and who would be counted worthy in the kingdom of heaven, it's always acts of service and acts of compassion. It's never not, it's never that the worthy person in the kingdom of God is the one who won the argument with somebody else or who conquered somebody else or who dominated somebody else. Like that's never the, the standard that Jesus sets out. But in the church in America, we very much have this idea of, you know, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's like the big thing in American evangelicalism. And it's about winning the argument and proving 
the the skeptic wrong about Christianity, and we've seen where that kind of ideology has led. It's caused a lot of division in our society, and it has created an environment where uh, people who are outside the church are really skeptical of the church because they see it presented in this very authoritarian manner. Um, and that's really a misrepresentation of the, of the gospel that, that Jesus taught. Um, uh, Lenore Three Stars uh, and uh, her comments on Mark Charles' book that he wrote with Sun Chun Ra, Unsettling Truths, um, which is all about the, the doctrine of discovery that was in the church. She wrote, uh, the ideology of Christian discovery resulted in the dehumanization of the indigenous people of Turtle Island. Those principles continue to oppress. If you are a native who follows Jesus, you have been hard pressed to explain the difference between your faith and the dysfunctional theology that birth an exploitive Christian worldview that cultivated genocide and slavery. Um, and I think that really kind of gets to the heart to it, that you really have to say the church in America has really misunderstood and misrepresented uh, the concepts that Jesus put forward. And, and Jesus really was taking the arc of Scripture from the Old Testament and fulfilling that. You know, Jesus said, I haven't come to replace the word, but I've come to fulfill it. Um, and, and again, uh, we're heading into um, what the church in general recognizes as the Advent season, where we look forward uh, to the coming of Jesus, uh, who the church celebrates at the end of December. Um, even though Casey can tell you at length that that's not really when Jesus was most likely born. Um, but in any case, we're moving into that season of really thinking about the incarnation and thinking about Jesus coming. Um, and I'm kind of skipping ahead in the Advent calendar. If you're someone who follows the Advent calendar, usually around this time, we're talking about, um, ab about the relational connections between Jesus and and John the Baptist. And when their mothers came together, when Mary went to visit Elizabeth, um, even from inside the womb, they recognized who each other was. And there was a lot of activity. And uh, Elizabeth described it as John leaping for joy in her womb uh, when the news of Mary and uh, the baby Jesus still inside of Mary came to visit them. Um, but I want to jump ahead a little bit to the actual birth of Jesus, because um, I think that's significant. Um, the first people who were given news about Jesus's birth um, were the shepherds in the fields. And um, shepherds were considered the very lowest you could be in like that society. Um, while the Jewish people in general came from a nomadic kind of pastoral herding kind of people, by that time, a lot of them lived in more urban clusters like in Jerusalem and the villages around Jerusalem. And, um, and shepherds were really not held in any regard whatsoever. Um, there were two groups of people in that society whose word was not considered worthy to be used in the court of law. So who could not give testimony in, in court was women who Jesus also treated as equals and uh, liberated in a lot of ways, even though he didn't use that terminology. But uh, women couldn't testify in court legally and shepherds couldn't testify in court legally. Um, so when creator comes to the, the earth, he comes in a lowly manner um, and he comes to identify with the outcasts and the downtrodden. And I think that's, that's pretty hard for us to imagine sometimes. But, you know, when Jesus came, you know, they had to travel up to Bethlehem. There was no room for them to stay. So they found an um, uh, animal stockade, basically, which was probably a cave in the side of a cliff somewhere or a very small, stinky building. Um, and they went in there because that was the only place that they could get out of the weather. And when Jesus was born, 
they cleaned out a feeding trough the best that they could and they used the feeding trough for the the crib um i think to put that in context of our current day and age that would be like you know jesus uh mary and joseph come to a town they can't find any place to stay and so they go in the alley behind the hotel and they climb into the dumpster to get some protection from the weather and uh and and jesus is born inside of a dumpster um that really is like the closest equivalent uh to to what we have now um so so jesus has a lot of identity with the downtrodden and and the and the outcast um and again it's in making those connections making that relationship and you can't walk in harmony you can't walk in balance you can't walk in beauty if you don't acknowledge the marginalized and the disenfranchised Um, because those are all your relations too and to be in right relationship with the marginalized you have to walk alongside them and become marginalized yourself in a a lot of a lot of ways Um, i'm just going to read this this from randy's book um he says since all things are redeemed in christ then restoring the world to god's intentions of shalom is the point of christian redemption in a very real sense christ restores harmony back to our lives our world and our universe um western theologians and missionaries believe that the host people of this land turtle island had no stories worth hearing they did not and still do not for the most part want to hear about indigenous people's relationship with creator um and he goes on to say that uh, a lot of the problem contributing to this limited view of salvation from the kind of eurocentric perspective is that um european culture and even european languages like when you think about english as a language um it's a very it's very focused on things on stuff um and so there's lots of words to describe a thing um but there's not so many to describe like uh, relationships and and connections and um i was talking with leah when she was preparing for one of her tests and uh and she said that uh, like Navajo only has about 4,000 words, which is a pretty small amount for a language. Um, most languages have hundreds of thousands of, of words. And, um, and she was saying like, yeah, when I talk to people about, oh, well, how do you say good? And they say, oh, that's Nijoni. Well, how do you say beautiful? Oh, Nijoni. You know, how do you, how do you express a good feeling? Oh, that's Nijoni. And so, if you're looking at it casually from the outside, you would think, oh, well, maybe this is just a primitive language and they don't have that many words. Um, but the difference is that in Navajo, it's all about the context. It's all about the relationship. So even though there's one actual word, Nujoni, that represents all these different concepts, the understanding of the concepts are much deeper because you have to understand the relationship between the words in a sentence and the implied relationship that that has because of who is saying it and who they're saying it to and that kind of thing is very hard to translate so even though navajo has a smaller vocabulary of words it's actually a much deeper and richer language because it carries with it all these implied connections of relationships um when I was trying to explain that idea uh, to my son and so that he could really grasp it, I said, it's kind of like if you think about guitar players in uh, modern music, you know, you have these like kind of heavy metal guys who are all about the technique and playing as many notes as they can. So, you know, in a, a 12 bar section, they're gonna jam as many physical notes as they can in that and play as fast as they can and just you know rip up and down that's what english is like english sentences have a ton of words um english language uses a lot of words to communicate things so we're we're jamming all that in 
Um, but a blues player, on the other hand, is all about the feeling of the note and the relationship of the sound of that note to the other things around it in the music. So a blues player, while the heavy metal guy is you know, playing a flurry of 100 notes, the blues player might just be on one note, but he's subtly bending it. He's letting it fade out. He's bringing it back up. And he's doing all these things with the one note that communicates a much deeper emotion and feeling. And I think if you think about when you listen to that kind of music, when you listen to music that's very fast and has a lot of notes, you're kind of like, oh, wow, that's impressive. But it doesn't really get to your heart. Where like blues music like cuts right to your gut cuts right to your heart, right to your, your emotion. Um, and so I think that's a big difference between just the whole native worldview and the European worldview. Uh, European worldview is very busy and there's a lot going on, but it's all going on on the surface. Where in the native worldview, it doesn't seem as busy, but it's much deeper and, and richer. And, and again, that has a lot of congruence with Jesus's message uh, in the in the Gospels, because he's always whenever Jesus does something, he's always about making the connection with somebody. When the woman was healed that touched Jesus's garment, it wasn't enough for him that she was just healed. He wanted to speak to her. Why? Because he wanted to establish relationship with her and make that that moment of a miracle even deeper and richer than it would have been um, otherwise. And then, um, let me see here. Um, uh, Randy also, Randy Woodley also brought out uh, about in the parables, Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep. And if you're not familiar with that story, it's to give you the nutshell version. Shepherd has a flock of 100. When he goes to count them, he counts 99. One sheep is missing. Um, so he leaves the 99 and goes after the one. There's a, then Jesus follows that up with a parable of a woman um, who lost a coin. And her focus becomes finding that coin. She cleans and sweeps her whole house, overturns everything until she finds that, that missing coin. And then Jesus tells the, the story of the prodigal son which you could really think of as the story of the lost son. But really, it's the story of the lost sons because the elder brother is really the one who's more lost in the end because he, he carries bitterness in his heart against his younger brother. So even once the younger brother who had gone out and done all this crazy stuff and wasted his inheritance, you know, he learns from that and he repents and he comes back to the father but the elder brother who was, you know, doing everything by the book, he's still, he's like he's trapped in bitterness and anger about the injustice of his brother getting off. Um, and Jesus was really telling that to speak to the religious leaders to say, don't disdain these people who you view as outcasts. When one of them comes to know creator, you need to rejoice with them and join join with them um, but at that point the religious leaders were all about their position of status just like the older brother they were like hey I'm the good guy I've been doing the right thing that guy's a you know a sinner that shows up again when Jesus talks about the two men who were praying and the one very pious religious man you know prays and says God I thank you that I'm not a lowly guy like this person over here who's obviously a sinner in a low life you know, thank you that you've made me an upright and righteous person. And and the 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 low life, the sinner guy, he just cry, cries, cries out to God, God, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, that's the guy who really established a relationship with creator in that moment. The guy who thought he had it all together had no relationship with creator. So again, it's that bringing about relationship. And that has real congruence with the native worldviews of the harmony way and the beauty way um, about having being in right relationship with creator 
Uh, and how do you be in right relationship with Creator? Because you're in right relationship with all of your relations. And that's how you walk um, in a good way. And uh, I think with that, I'll stop rambling on. But I'd like to um, open up the floor for uh, questions or comments. Um, and even, even if it's like, man, I think you're totally out to lunch, Brian. Didn't you think about these scriptures and blah, blah, blah? Like, I, I welcome that conversation. Um, Paul said that to a lot of the churches he was preaching to. He's like, don't just take my word for it. You know, go search the scriptures and see if what I'm saying is right. Um, so, yeah, in a synopsis, it's all about the relationship and the native perspective, the native worldview understands that important of relationships much better than the church in America for the most part does right now. Um, and so I think the church has a lot to learn from native people. And I think we would all do well to kind of take that native uh, perspective. All right. So I will stop there. Anybody have any questions, comments, chastisements, whatever <laughs> the floor is open for anything. Well, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> No, you did. You did a great job. Um, really, really like the things you hear about the Harmony Way and living in Shalom. And one of one of my things I try to push all the time is uh, uh, if we want to worship God in spirit and truth, we might be able to do it in spirit, but we're uh, what I like to say is we're not being true to ourselves. So how can shalom and harmony be a part of our, our worship to God? Because we're denying, we have always been denied who we are as Native people. And we've always had to accept that in order to be a Christian, we had to become a white replica of the, those that you know were the missionaries among us. So to have a true harmony way in ministry, how do you see that here as we work in Albuquerque? Um, I, well, one thing that reminds me of right away is uh, the scripture patches passage that says, um, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. And I think when most people read that, they're just thinking about, oh, that Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And if we know Jesus, um, then we'll be set free. But I think that also means knowing the truth about yourself. And uh, so that means knowing the truth about your own shortcomings and, and where you need help. But it also means knowing the truth about who you are. And like you said, Casey, um, a lot of Native people on this continent have had that stripped away, really people in, of color in general. If you weren't part of the white status quo colonizing forces, uh, you were marginalized. And part of that marginalization was stripping you of your heritage and your traditions and your culture. Um, so I think, yeah, you need to know that truth, too. You need to know who you are um, and, and that that can set you free, because once you know who you are, then you're able to really have relationship with people. If you don't know who you are in yourself, how do you have relationship with anybody? Um, so, yeah, it starts with knowing knowing who you are. And I think in terms of um, Good Medicine Way, what we're doing here, that's really what we're trying to do is to help people to see who they are, who God created them to be, and how do you walk in a good way with that knowledge of yourself um, and also um, deepen your knowledge of, of Jesus and of Creator. Um, that brings up another interesting thing, too that Randy Woodley said that uh, in, in English, we really want to keep everything separate and compartmentalized. So we think of, oh, Jesus is the Son, and God the Father is the Creator, and God the Holy Spirit is the one who is with us and inspires us. Um, but really, they're all the same. You know, they, they kind of manifest in different ways, and but they're really all they're all creator they're all they're all god and and english doesn't have a good way to handle that and uh randy uh in his book 
talked about in Cherokee, like you can call Jesus the creator son and that all works. Like you can understand that Jesus is at the same time creator because the Bible tells us that all things were made through him. So Jesus is at once creator, which is normally an attribute that English uh, thinking, speaking people say, oh no, that's God the Father. But no, Jesus is creator and he's also son at the same time. And and I think our, our Western uh, viewpoints and perspectives like have a, have a real difficulty with understanding that. Um, so I think that as we empower native people and as we empower them being able to look into their own traditions and seeing where God creator was already speaking to their people um, that they can grow up in that. And I think in the end, they really have a fuller understanding than um, people like me who were born into the white status quo, who, who can't really conceive that very well. And then we can see it looks like Namar and Karen both might have things to say. Um, did you have something, Namar, that you wanted to share? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, yes. Well, you know, first of all, let me just say I appreciate the uh, the message and the work that that you've done tonight. And same with you, Leah. You know, y'all done great work tonight. Great message. Yes, yeah, so I would just say that there's a couple of things that you know that came to mind is that within the American Christianity as well as much of Western Christianity, you know, what what has been very outstanding is the culture of that has been teaching God in a way that suits us rather than teaching others how we suit God, if if that can if that can make sense. You know, that's been that's been the context of the culture of American Christianity. Because, you know, it's, it's really not Christianity in terms of what the scripture says, what the scripture describes, whether it's American Christianity. There's a big difference between Christianity and American Christianity. You know, American Christianity has a cultural context of how God is to be described and interpreted in a way that suits and makes sense to American culture, American mainstream white culture, if you will. And then as far as, you know, what, what you said about, you know, Randy and, and yes, and I know Randy, I've known him for years, you know, and dear friend, him and his family, and he and I have, you know, we've talked and, and I've heard him preach and teach about, about creator, Jesus and the Holy Spirit all being one, you know, so through the scripture, we learn that God exists within three distinct persons. And that's, I would say that that's beyond human understanding. You know, we as human beings, we just can't fully understand that. We just can't, you know, and within American English and which, and language, by the way, does have a strong, a strong relation to culture of any persons. The language has a strong relation to that person's or people's culture within the English language pertaining to the American English culture, what we have a problem with is allowing distinct beings to be co-equal. There's always this, culturally, there's always this, in this, uh, this uh, notion that someone has to stand out above all the rest. You know, that's American culture and that's much of Western culture. Somebody has to stand out above and beyond the others. Whereas within the Trinity, it teaches three existing in one. Relation, community, all existing together as one body, one, one people, because we believe in one God. But God exists within three different, three distinct beings. We as a body of Christ, a body of believers, we are all but one body. But we exist as distinct individuals, right? So yeah, so that's something that we as believers, and you know, especially those those of us that are American, that's what we have to gain a better understanding of. And 
we not only do we have to accept that, but we have to embrace that because there's a difference between accepting and embracing. Accepting means we tolerate it. You know, we'll let it be. Embracing means we welcome that. You know, so we have to embrace that as well as we have to embrace each other. I hope. Yeah, that was great. Thank you for that. This is some really amazing insights. I like when you said about how like we tend to want to reform God uh, into what suits us um, rather than seeing how we suit God. I really love that. That's a great line. I should love I, that. Should I read these four little comments before Carrie? Uh, yeah, okay. but let me let me address here what Namara was saying. So yeah, I really like that, and I like the the whole idea how you brought out how uh, as Americans, we're all about hierarchy and authority and who's in, in charge. And that really stems from when Rome co-opted Christianity, you know, they're a very militaristic, a very conquest oriented thing. So they really established that whole idea of like, oh, we have to have all this hierarchy and everything. And, and you see that in so much of the teaching in the church in America is about who has authority, what's the proper hierarchy, who's over what, who has jurisdiction over what. Um, but the scriptures say, in Christ, there's e there's not Jew, there's not Greek, there's not slave, there's not free, there's not, not man, not woman. We're all one in Christ. And so, and, and that messes with our ideas of hierarchy and who's in charge. So yeah, I really, really lo love those, those insights. Um, you had a couple things right. from there? Lee McCoo says, thank you, Brian, well said, well illustrated. Jeanette Delman says, wow, great explanation of the prodigal son and his brother. And Sue Martell says, good job, Brian. I retired as an RN last year. I used what I learned from Casey and the others when caring for my indigenous clients. It was a huge blessing. And Jeanette Delman also said, I've heard that God is like the architect. Jesus is the foreman and the Holy Spirit is the carpenter. <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean i think yeah those ideas are are important and like what namar was saying like they they coexist together and I, we just have a hard time getting our heads around that and who knows like like namar was saying i don't even know if we if my mortal brain can even fully conceive that but but i understand it as as a conception that yeah there's all these different ways that god moves and all these different roles but yet they're all one and in together so yeah really good insights all around i really like that did you have something karen you look like yeah. you're eager to say something <laughs> uh yeah it goes along with what casey was saying and then your comment on it right after this just kind of dovetails into that this morning in my quiet time i had just uh i i really was deeply praying into how we approach the situation of coming alongside Native Americans and making an, an enormous change. And the thing that God just really showed to me, it's not a new concept to any of us here, but, but I really think he put it in the very center of what some of what we are going to be transmitting in our ministries. And that is personal self-worth because when a person sees themselves through the eyes of other people other cultures their own culture because there's a whole lot of abuse and, and mean stuff that goes on within cultures of the same people and if we can submit the idea to people that if they can tune in to creator and see themselves through his eyes then the this idea of hopelessness and the despair that people come to because they think wow if i've been so abused if 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 we've been so put down and this and that if they're not reminded of their worthiness <laughs> of creator and who they are to him no matter anybody else, I just believe God showed me our message has got to stem with making people aware of their incredible worthiness to God. And so much so that he sent his son to die for them 
as an individual. And I just, I just, I just feel that's kind of key, making people know their worth in the eyes of God and see themselves that way. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. Yeah, that, I mean, that really is kind of like how I was talking about how you have to know who you are. And I think a lot of that is, yeah, understanding that who you are has great worth in the eyes of creator. And I, yeah, I think that's, that's important. And especially for people who've suffered trauma, whether it's, um, you know, kind of a more systemic trauma, where like most of the people of color in this country have suffered some kind of systemic trauma, but then you also have the individual trauma, um, which goes beyond any kind of racial or cultural lines. I mean, we all have the ways that we suffer. Um, but yeah, but it can, it can be very easy to get caught up in that idea of, um, I'm just what my suffering is. I'm, I'm just this victim. Um, and you can get like really trapped and locked in that in an, in an unhealthy way. So yeah, I think that's really important um and uh, and again that gets that gets back into you know having a right relationship uh, with all your relatives and it also means having a right relationship with yourself so being able to look at your own woundedness being able to look at your own faults um being able to look at your own brokenness regardless of where that came from and being able to say like yeah that's part of who i am but that's not all of who i am and, uh, and I think that gets back to what, like Namara said, like, how do we suit God? You know, we, we have to see how God sees us. And, and yeah, I think that's really important what, what you said, that, that understanding that we have intrinsic worth in, in the eyes of God, regardless of, of what we've been through. So, yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's how we walk in beauty. That's how we walk in harmony. That's how we walk in right relationship. That's how the truth sets us free when we know who we are and then we fully understand that God still loves us. Um, so yeah, yeah, good, good insight. Really love it. Anything else over there? That's kind of, um, if, if no one has any further comments, that's kind of a good seg, is it seg or segue? Segway. Into our next song, really flows with it. <laughs> Lord Creator made us all so wonderfully. He knit us in our mother's wombs. All he makes is wonderful. You hold us in your loving hands. So that, That'll go right into that. All right. So I guess we're moving into the song. Um, and if you think of something while we're singing and you want to bring it up, um, I'm not too strict about like, oh, this is our question and answer time. And now that's done. We're past that. So, yeah. So we'll sing the song because it fits in well with where we're at right now. Um, but feel free to uh, put a comment in the chat or on Facebook or, or to say it. And uh, we're just going to sing this one little song real quick. Are you going to leave the vocal? Sure. Am I going to follow you? Okay. So let me get back in reality out of the cloud. Okay. Um, 
All right. So, any other questions, comments, insights, criticisms, revelations before uh, we have a prayer time? You want me to read that one? Oh, yeah. What do we got? Thank you, Brian, and for the, all the thoughtful sharing tonight. What I appreciated was the image of Jesus and his earthly parents in a contemporary dumpster. What an image. Jesus still came to us into this stink to save us and give us an abundant life in him. Yeah, yeah. That kind of ties in with the skunk. Yeah, oh yeah, there's your skunk. <laughs> it all, it all, it's all connected. It all comes back around. Yeah. No, actually, I think, you know, when you talk about like nativity scenes and we we're all familiar with that and we sing away in the manger and it's very nice pretty but it wasn't nice it wasn't pretty it was dirty it was stinky uh it was uncomfortable uh it was probably uh cold um you know and so yeah that's i think it's i think it's good to kind of reframe those kinds of stories um in the context that we understand and that we can relate to um you know because otherwise you know we i mean they don't even say it's a feeding trough like they would say oh he was lied in a manger like i didn't know what a manger was like all the time i was growing up as a kid i just uh, whatever they put jesus jesus laid in the manger whatever that is um you know so so uh, you know it was you know so i think yeah it's good to to think about those things in a in a concept that we can understand Casey, do you want to do the prayer time? Yes, let's, let's do that. Father, we thank you for coming together tonight and for the words that were shared. I, I pray that we continue to grow from the words and the teachings that we hear. Thank you for all those that uh, had something to uh, share and and bring out even further insight that we, we look to you for all the guidance when we hear these and that it may find a place in our hearts that we can make it uh, put shoe leather to it put hands and feet to words that we hear thank you for our teacher tonight we pray for each one that's here and keep us safe during this time of covid we thank you for all of those that are working so hard to bring an end to it those are the doctors and the scientists and the leaders that are making it possible to bring the vaccines to us you keep us strong keep us safe bring us together again as we are continue to do our ministry online like so many others keep us bless us as we continue to do your work among the people we live around. Amen. Preston, you want to give us a cinderoffer? Yeah. <clears throat> so... I'm going to read uh, today's Bible uh, verse, verse of the day from the You Can Bible app. Such things were written in scriptures long ago to teach us. And scriptures gives us hope and encouragement as we wait printingly for God's promise to be fulfilled. Um, when I was going through this today, it made me, I was taught like how if we allow ourselves to learn things that were in the past, we can be able to uh, go through that, be able to use those teachings and be able to use those things to help us fight and, and be able to encourage us that God is always there, that he has always been there and he is still here. And we can always and forever use his love. And it's just making sure that we continue changing um, the future and not and we can continue remembering the past so that we can remember who we are, but who we are supposed to be. So that we can remember that we are creators of, in the image of God. Again, but it's always a pleasure to be with here with you guys. I love being here with you guys. So until next week, love y'all. 
All right. Thanks, everybody, everybody, for coming. Stay safe. And we'll see you all next week, I hope. Woohoo.